Lord, I want to thank you so much for everything that you do. I want to thank you so much for being so uh, willing to meet us uh, in this place this morning, for bringing us together as a local church family. I want to thank you for your grace. I want to thank you for your son, uh, Jesus Christ. I want to thank you, Lord, for your righteousness, that even in my unrighteousness, you would allow me not just to see your glory, but to actually be brought in to dwell in your glory for for my own good. Lord, as we dive into this text of Scripture, we come before you as, as broken people, asking you to, to speak to us through your text. Lord, to convict us where we need to be convicted, to encourage us where we need to be encouraged. Lord, this morning we ask that you give us eyes to see, you give us ears to hear, you give us minds to understand something more about you. Lord, please bring us closer to yourself this morning. Increase our love for one another. Increase our love for you, Lord. And as I this morning attempt to speak your word, Lord, I ask that you enable me and give me the power to do so rightly, even though I come from a place, Lord, of unrighteousness. Lord, we love you so much again, and thank you for everything that you do, absolutely everything that you do. And in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 I, uh, I grew up in church. Uh, my parents uh, went to a Baptist church and they took me to church with them. Um, part of my testimony is that while I was growing up in church, up until uh, a moment when I was 15 years o old and God uh, got a hold of me and said, I am real and you need me and you can't live life on your own. Uh, up until this moment, uh, my opinion of the church was not very good. Uh, I was not an, an atheist or I wouldn't have described myself as an atheist, but maybe a deist. Maybe I believed that God was there, um, but I, I didn't think that the church presented a really good picture of who God was. Um, people seem to me to come into the church building and pretend to be more righteous than they actually were, to pretend to be holy, pretend to be uh, pious, to pretend to have uh, everything uh, together. That was what I saw in church as I was growing up in church. I remember uh, my fellow students, children who were, who were children at the same time that I was a, a child, they would cuss outside of church at school, cussing, cursing, foul language, filthy language. As soon as they step foot into the church building, N no, that you can, we can't talk like that in church. They would get onto others for talking uh, like that in church. And it just seemed uh, like this kind of irony. Like they would say, you can't say that in church. And even though God, as we learned about in church, was supposed to be this omnipresent figure. Like no matter where we are, God is. And no matter what we do, uh, God is is watching. Um, and so there was this sort of irony there in that statement. Uh, the real reason I thought church was a joke that I didn't want anything uh, to do with the church um, was because I did see many, many people coming in and pretending. They would say uh, within the context of church that God is the one who saves, period. Amen. We believe that. Absolutely. God is the one who saves. Saving grace is a work of of God, but then people would pretend to have everything together like somehow they needed to impress God or like somehow uh, they had to convince God by being a good enough person within the church building to save them. Um, and so I just saw this, this kind of double-sided double -sided faith. Um, the church to me was a church full of pretenders, people pretending to be righteous. So this morning, I want to, I want to ask what righteousness is. 
I want to look into the book of Romans and the theme of the book of Romans, remember, is, is faith and righteousness. Faith and righteousness throughout the entire book of Romans. And so I want to define what righteousness actually is. What is righteous action? Uh, you know, righteousness uh, might be defined as a standard for right action. It might be defined as the right action itself. If somebody is surfing, a wave might be righteous or in some people's kitchen, a smell might be righteous. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so we say righteous a lot, or we, we refer to righteousness a lot, but I really want to think about what righteousness is. What is this thing called righteousness? Romans, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. This is the word of God. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented Him, that's Jesus, as an atoning sacrifice, or some translations there will say propitiation, which means the same thing, in His blood, received through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His restraint God passed over the sins previously committed. God presented him, Jesus, to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that the world, uh, so that he would be righteous or just and declare righteous or justify the one who has faith in Jesus. In this text of Scripture, we receive the definition of righteousness. And as we look into this text of Scripture, I want to look at it in three parts. First of all, I want to define righteousness according to the Word. So we'll look at righteousness in the Bible. And then, just like we did last week, we'll compare this to uh, other thoughts regarding righteousness in the world. So we'll look at righteousness in the Bible, righteousness in the world. And then finally, we'll apply this idea of righteousness. Uh, we'll look at righteousness in action. So first of all, righteousness in the Bible remember uh, last week we talked about faith. We defined faith. What is faith? What is this thing called uh, faith? We looked at Romans chapter 1 verses 16 and 17 and we defined faith according to Romans chapter 1. Let me just remind us uh, of this thing called faith because the righteous, the righteous, which is what we're talking about today, live by faith. So you can't talk about righteousness without also talking about faith. So let me just read this definition of faith uh, that we got last week from the first chapter in the book of Romans. Faith is a gift from God, not a work of self, that causes God's people to depend fully on God and reveals the righteousness of God, not people. There's that word righteousness again. Righteousness of God, not people, for the purpose of our humility and God's glory, bringing about obedience in those who are given faith. Let me read that one more time for us so we can get this definition just sort of uh, marinating in our minds. Faith is a gift from God, not a work of self, that causes God's people to depend fully on God and reveals the righteousness of God, not people, for the purpose of our humility and God's glory, bringing about obedience in those who are given faith. Again, Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says this about righteousness. Those who are righteous live by faith which means that those who are righteous are not living by works. Those who are righteous are not living by merit. Those who are righteous are not depending on someone else's good deeds. They're not depending on their own good deeds. They're not having to work for salvation. Those who are righteous live by faith. Those who are righteous live by faith according to how we have just defined faith. Here in Romans chapter 3, verses uh, 21 through 26, some other things are said about righteousness. So we remember that righteous, uh, those who are righteous live by faith. We also know according to verse 21 uh, here in Romans chapter 3 that the righteousness of God has been revealed. So righteousness, righteousness is something that specifically belongs belongs to God. Righteousness does not belong to me, and righteousness does not belong to you or anyone else in this world. Righteousness belongs to God. God 
is the righteous one. In verse 22, we read that righteousness of God, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ. So when we are seeking righteousness, we're not seeking our own righteousness that we might work for our righteousness or merit our righteousness or do good deeds to attain our righteousness or rely on the deeds of someone else to gain our righteousness. A righteousness of God, which is what we want. We want God's righteousness. We don't want righteousness that comes up in our self is through through faith in Jesus Christ. So the righteous live by faith, but we actually gain the righteousness of God through faith. I seem to remember another verse in Ephesians chapter 2 that says we are saved by grace through faith. We actually receive righteousness by grace through faith. And this righteousness, the righteousness of God, is given to all who believe there in verse 22. Verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's what this means. My sin, since we're talking about righteousness in the context of this passage of Scripture, my sin did not cause me to be unrighteous. All right, My sin caused me to fall from the grace of God. My sin caused me to be separated from God. My sin did not cause unrighteousness. Paul here is using sin as evidence for the existence of unrighteousness. So it's like I am unrighteous, and when I sin, I reveal my unrighteousness. God gave the law, and we'll talk about this in just a couple moments. God gave the law as a testimony against people so that when we disobeyed the law, we would rest recognize the unrighteousness that was already within us. And we'll also define unrighteousness here in just a moment. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. If I have sinned one time, I reveal that I do not have the righteousness of God. I reveal that I am unrighteous if I sin one time. So we get into this, uh, this mentality, I think, and I think uh, this has been, been taught in, in the church, um, in some churches at least, at some point in time uh, in the history of the church, that there are these scales of justice, right? And if you are a righteous person, if you do what is right and you do what is just and you do what is good and you conform your action you know, to the righteousness of Christ that belongs to Christ because of Christ's action, <laughs> then you will weigh on the scales of justice and you will, you will weigh uh, either you will weigh more in your good deeds than you do in your bad deeds or your righteous acts will be weighed against the righteous acts of Christ. And, and if, uh, if, you, if you weigh with Christ as you are measured by Christ and somehow you will make it into heaven or you will be justified uh, by the God of the universe. Look, if all have sinned and if all fall short of the glory of God, God, and one sin reveals my unrighteousness, then there is no way I could possibly make up for that on any sort of of justice scale. See, if we were to say that sin causes unrighteousness, there might be a way for me to do a good deed and counteract that sin and somehow let my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds and and make it into heaven or be justified before God or make it into the place where those who are just will be according to God. But my sin does not cause me to be unrighteous. My sin reveals, it reveals my unrighteousness. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace. There it is, by grace. Justified by grace. Declared to be righteous by grace. By grace through faith. By grace through faith. Verse 25, God presented Him as a propitiation or an atoning sacrifice in His blood received through through faith for the purpose of to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. Verse 26, God presented him again two times in this text of Scripture. God presented him in this way as a propitiation, as an atonement for our sins, in order to demonstrate his righteousness. God did not send Jesus, or Jesus did not come. He was not born as a baby. He did not grow into manhood. He did not give himself on the cross, listen, to make me righteous. Stay with me because there is a nuance here we really need to understand. If God is in the business of making me righteous, 
then he is giving me the opportunity to, in my works, become righteous of my works, of my deeds, and of my merit. And that is not what God is doing whatsoever. Verse 26 here in the text of Scripture, verses 25 and 26, actually state specifically that God's, God's goal in this atoning work, in his work of justification, is to not make us righteous, not weigh us on the scales of justice and try and find us to be righteous in his sight or justified. No, his goal and his work of justification is to declare the righteousness of Christ, to make his own righteousness known against our unrighteousness, to give us his righteousness, not a righteousness of our own, to declare righteous those who believe in him. Verse 26 again, that he, Jesus, would be righteous or just. Jesus would be righteous or Jesus would be seen as righteous and that Jesus would declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus that Jesus would declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. I want to, for a second, before we define righteousness, before we take this verse of Scripture, I think that is pretty robust, a pretty robust definition of what righteousness is. So we could stop here and we could define righteousness just according to this verse. But I want to take a journey through Scripture with you. I want to take a journey through Scripture and discover together what what the rest of the Bible says about righteousness. And we don't have time to hit every Scripture. I know that I said earlier, I don't have my watch, and we may run longer. Look, I'm not going to look at every verse of Scripture that has to do with righteousness. (laughs) But I do want to look at a few. Psalm chapter 14, 1 through 3, and chapter 53, 1 through 3 say the same thing. There is no one, no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. No one is righteous. God, the only being, who is righteous. People are not. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. There is certainly no righteous man on the earth who does good and never sins. There is no righteous man on the earth. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees taught that we ought to follow the whole degree of the, of the law. They were pretty righteous people according to human standards. Yet Christ says, if your righteousness doesn't surpass theirs, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It would have been impossible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He made the one who did not know sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Again, righteousness belongs to God. Christ was given so that we might become the righteousness of of God, not produce righteousness in and of ourselves, not become self-righteous by our merit or by our deeds, but that we might become the righteousness of God. Therefore, Since we have been declared, this is Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous or justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Since we have been declared righteous. The text there does not say, since we have been made righteous or given the opportunity to produce works and merits in and of ourselves in order to please God. It does not say, since we have been found to be righteous. No, it says, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. They, some people over here, the uh, ethereal they, disregarded the righteousness from God and attempted to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves to God. 
to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteous to everyone who believes. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who, who believes. Again, we see righteousness is God's righteousness. What I consider to be my own righteousness or good deeds or good merit is not, is not classified by God, by, by Scripture here, as, as righteousness at all. Righteousness belongs to only God. Righteousness is given by only God. Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. More than that, I also consider everything to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them filth, so I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having, listen, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through, through faith in Christ. The righteousness from who? God, based on faith. The righteousness from, from God, based on faith. Faith. Matthew chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. Seek first, this is Jesus teaching, seek first the kingdom of God and his, his righteousness. And all these things will be provided for you or added unto you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And God, in His providence and in His sovereignty, will take care of you. That's a promise in the text of Scripture. And so, we get to this point now where we can define righteousness. According to our passage in the text of Romans and and according to Scripture as a whole, here is what we learn. This is, is righteousness according to the Bible. People are unrighteous, period. People are unrighteous, period. Righteousness belongs to God alone and is declared to people so that people receive the righteousness of Christ and are justified by Christ, never by merit. Righteousness must then be imputed to the one who has been given faith by grace. And this idea of the imputation of Christ's righteousness is the idea that God is not just making me righteous so that I can do righteous deeds, so that I can be found to please Him. It is the idea that Christ is actually taking His righteousness and He is infusing that in my person so that when I am seen by the God of the universe who judges the world, I am seen to have the righteousness of Christ, not my own righteousness. And that is what imputation means. Let me read this definition for you again. People are, oh, look, I have a little clock right here. Look at this. I can watch. I have a little clock. This is awesome. All right. Sorry. (laughs) Definition of righteousness. Again, people are unrighteous. Righteousness belongs to God alone and is declared to people so that people receive the righteousness of Christ and are justified by Christ, never by merit. Righteousness must then be imputed to the one who has been given faith by grace. By grace. So Christ's righteousness, it's, it's actually made evident through the faith of his people. So Christ gives faith Through that faith uh, and through the imputation of Christ's righteousness, I am not seen for my own righteous deeds. I am not seen for my own merit. I am not seen for my own deeds. In fact, guys, I shouldn't even have the pulpit at all. All right, let's just just invite Jesus to come and speak to us. Can we do that from the Bible? I guess this is exactly what's happening, right? Because we're we're preaching his word and not the word of Andrew Cannon, which is really, really nice because I don't need to be heard anyway. But the word of the word of God does. Verse 26, particularly in our passage for today, here in Romans chapter 3, says that that this whole thing, Christ's atoning work, it is not to produce a righteousness that comes from myself. It is not that I might be weighed against Christ and found to either be righteous or unrighteous. This atoning work, God's saving grace, God's saving us, this work of justification, justifying us before Himself, It is not so that we might be recognized at all, 
It is so that Christ might be seen as the righteous one. So people might recognize, recognize the righteousness of God. And so that I might be humbled and revealed as unrighteous and desperately, desperately in need of the righteousness, the righteousness of God. This is going to have huge implications, right, for the way that we live, for the way that we do church, for the way that we think about our relationship with Jesus. This has huge, huge implications for us. It means that there there are so many people, guys, who, who work so hard, work so hard to look pious or to look religious or to look righteous or to make their lives look perfect. And we live in an age of social media, right, where people only let you see what they, what they want you to see. And I have a feeling that's been true for a long time, but it's especially true now in an, area, in an era of social media where people only post the pictures of them smiling on Facebook and on Instagram and only uh, put their clever little quotes on, on Twitter. And rarely do we see somebody's uh, imperfections because everybody wants to present themselves as this perfect person, this pious person. And so many churches today, uh, people aren't aren't themselves, they aren't honest about who they are and their sinfulness and their brokenness and their, and their insufficiency. And too many people feel like they have to try and look perfect. Feel like they have to, to dress up with outward appearances so that people don't see their hearts or their minds or who, or who they really are, their mistakes. And we, we try and hide those mistakes. How exhausting. How exhausting is this. We get stressed out about being ritualistic in our religion. We get stressed out when other people aren't doing the, the things that we think they ought to be doing. We, we get so stressed out. Look, if, if righteousness belongs to God, if all people are unrighteous, If Christ must impute his righteousness to us, and when we are measured, we are not measured according to what we've done, but according to who Christ is, then there is absolutely no reason for all of this stress and all of this freaking and all this trying to look perfect and all of this dressing up and all this wearing a a, a mask so that people don't figure out who we really are. There's, There's no reason for that. In fact, that, according to the book of Romans here, and we'll discover that in just, just a couple moments, is, is the very unrighteousness Paul is talking about. Trying to be your own righteousness. Trying to earn your own righteousness by merit or by trying to look perfect or by trying to sing the right songs or by having the right theology. I was talking with a buddy of mine um, who is called to preach, and we were talking about uh, different viewpoints in, in theology. And... Uh, one of the conclusions we came to during our, our discussion was this. Look, if we worship our theology more than we worship God, then we've got a major problem. My theology doesn't save me. My knowledge doesn't save me. God is the only one who can do that. I am so thankful that He imputes His righteousness and doesn't leave it to me to develop this righteousness on my own. Look, God doesn't save us to make us righteous. He doesn't save us to make us righteous. This saving work is so that we will recognize the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ, and we will be drawn to worship Him. Brothers and sisters, those listening on Facebook Live who were so stressed out this morning trying to get kids ready for church and just didn't make it, all right? Those stressing out about all of this human-centered religion stuff or stressing out about not being good enough or trying to look perfect or trying to look, look pious. Look, don't be so stressed when it comes to the things of God. Don't be so stressed when it comes to the things of God. The goal of the gospel is not that you would be made perfect or made righteous. The goal of the gospel is not that you would be found to be be righteous on the scales of justice that we often visualize. No, the the goal, the point of the gospel is so that God's righteousness would be 
made known and we would recognize, recognize our need for him. Here's what Jesus had to say. Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, because this was your good pleasure. All things have been entrusted to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son desires to reveal him. Come to me, listen, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He doesn't say, come to me, all you who have earned your righteousness, or come to me, all you who wish to be made righteous of your own merit and of your own deed. No, come to you, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I, Jesus, not Andrew Cannon, Jesus, I will give you rest. Take up my yoke, says Jesus, and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart. And get this, you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is is easy, and my burden is light. Tell me again why there's a reason to stress out over religiosity and ritual and trying to look perfect. There's not. Even Christ says, come to me, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Church, Grace Baptist Church, my family, let this be our invitation to our community. Let us say, and for those of you who are watching on Facebook Live and, and, and those who will watch this video later, look, come and be with us. Our yoke is easy and our burden is light. Why? Because we want to be like Jesus. You don't have to stress out about religion. Here, we can be honest with one another. We don't have to pretend to be perfect. We don't have to hold anybody to a higher standard of righteousness than Christ holds us to. And what is Christ's standard of righteousness that he holds us to? He he doesn't to save us. Because righteousness is a gift from God, belongs only to God, is imputed to us. It's not a righteousness of our own. It's a righteousness that comes from Christ by grace through faith. Come all you who are weary and burdened, and Christ will give you rest. And we can experience that amazing rest here. We don't put a yoke that is uneasy on someone, and we don't create a burden that is overburdensome for someone else. Why? Because we follow Christ. We follow Christ. What are the requirements for salvation? Only this, that Christ would save us and bring us to believe in in Him. That is the only thing that even has the, the semblance of requirements for salvation. For salvation. For the, for the imputation of God's righteousness to us. For elders and pastors... <laughs> What does this mean? The yoke of Christ is easy and the burden is light. What a relief. For deacons, what does this mean? The yoke of Christ is easy and His burden is light. What a relief. For small group and Sunday school teachers, ministry leaders, what does this mean? The yoke of Christ is easy and His burden is light. For our musicians, what does this mean? The yoke of Christ is easy. His burden is light. For all of our church members, what does this mean? The yoke of Christ is easy. His burden is light. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus that His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Because, because we are unrighteous. And because, and because Christ actually gives us a transfusion of His righteousness. That is an amazing truth to grab a hold of, to grasp regarding this thing called righteousness. Well, what does it mean then to have righteous action or to do good deeds or to obey the law that God has given? There sure do seem to be quite a few rules in this book, right? Quite a few rules given to the people of 
God. I want to point out three verses of Scripture to you. Uh, and you can write these down. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to, to give you these verses. Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. And Deuteronomy verses, uh, chapter 31, verse 26. Let me say that again. Romans chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Galatians chapter 3, verse 19. And Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 26. Here's what three, these three verses say. They all say basically the same thing regarding the giving of the law. They say this, that the law, the law of God was given in order to increase the trespass or to, to stand as a testimony against people. To increase the trespass, to stand as a testimony against the people because of the unrighteousness of people. And so when we look into the good and perfect law, look into the good, absolutely good and perfect law, we do not look into the law and make it a checklist for our lives, like if I do these things, then I will be found to be righteous before God. No, that's not the point of the law. It's not the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law, even according to the book of Deuteronomy, is to stand as a testimony against people. That when I look at the law, I wouldn't be looking at a checklist, but I would be looking into a mirror. And that mirror would reveal me to be unrighteous. There's no way I can keep this perfectly. There's no way I can obey the law of, of God on my own merit, according to my own willpower. And when I recognize, when I recognize that I am unrighteous, God then brings me to desire His righteousness And in saving me or in justifying me, Christ fully imputes his righteousness to me so that the law is then fulfilled in in Christ. The law is fulfilled in Christ. And he has made me righteous. Or rather, he has declared me to be righteous by infusing his righteousness to me and justifying me Thus, the law has accomplished its purpose in my life because I have looked into it and I have seen my own unrighteousness. I've seen my own righteousness. John, the apostle, the elder in the church of Ephesus, wrote this in 1 John 2, verse 29. If you know that He, Jesus, is righteous, you know this as well, Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. To do right, remembering back to last week now, to do right is to practice to practice faith. Faith is a gift given by God's grace, and it is complete dependence on on God for this thing called righteousness. So those who are righteous, they, they live by by faith, complete dependence on God, not by works and not by merit, trying to produce, trying to produce righteousness in and of themselves. And John even comes out and says it, that those who do right, who live by faith, not by their works or by their merit, not trying to develop their own righteousness, that those who, who, who do what is right, live by faith, are those who have been born of God. There's a second birth that has to take place, right? This transfusion of Christ's righteousness, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, all that happens in this moment. Without that, I am not justified before God. I must be transfused with the righteousness of Christ. I can't go to church enough, can't give enough money, can't do the right things, can't give enough money to the, to the poor, can't donate to enough charities, can't help my neighbor enough, all good things. But none of that makes us righteous because we can't be made righteous. We must be infused with the righteousness of Christ. That's the only way, the only way this thing works is if I am infused with the righteousness of Christ. Here is what I'm not saying. I am not saying that we cannot do good deeds. We can do good deeds. We should do good deeds. But even the atheist can do good deeds. Coming to Christ doesn't all of a sudden just enable us to do all of these good... No, we have the ability to do good deeds, even apart from Christ. 
Christ has prepared good deeds ahead of time for everyone. We can do good deeds. That's not the issue here. The issue is, am I righteous or am I unrighteous? The answer is, I am unrighteous and I need the righteousness of God to be infused within my person. I need the righteousness of Christ to be imputed to me so that I can be found to be justified before the God of the universe. The first thing that we learned this morning is this. God alone is righteous. God alone is righteous. It is His. I want to look at righteousness in the, in the world now. Just like we did last week when we compared this to, to other belief systems, other traditions, other ways of thinking, I want to compare it today as well. Compare this idea of righteousness just like we did with faith last week. Uh, Roman Catholics, and I'll, I will emphasize uh, the points that make, this, that make this different from what the Bible has, has revealed to us. Roman Catholics, according to the catechisms that they have available through the Vatican, uh, they say this, Justification detaches man from sin and contradicts the love of God and purifies his heart of sin. Justification follows upon God's merciful initiative and in offering forgiveness. It reconciles man with God and frees from the enslavement of sin, and it heals. Sounds pretty good so far. Justification is at the same time the acceptance of God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ, the personal acceptance of God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness or justice here means the rectitude of divine love. And if you don't know what rectitude means, that's okay. With justification, faith, hope, and charity are poured into our hearts and obedience obedience to the divine will is granted to us. You see the direction that this is going. That people are made righteous, all of a sudden you can become obedient to God and then be found to be righteous according to your work. Look, we might remember last week we we learned that the Catholic Church also believes that one can lose his or her salvation. Uh, Righteousness for the Catholic Church is something that is produced by God but is conferred through baptism, through a, a human work and by which God grants the person the ability to obey the divine will. It is up to the person to live righteously in order to be found righteous by God, in order to endure and maintain admittance into heaven. This, as we discovered in Scripture, is the very definition of of unrighteousness. This is the very definition of, of unrighteousness for us. We are made righteous Uh, People are made righteous of themselves, according to the Catholic Church, by God, and found to be righteous after being given the opportunity to become such by God. And some Protestants, we are Protestants, we're we're Baptists, we're Protestants, some Protestants believe the the same thing, uh, believe similarly or in line with this thinking. Mormons here believe that, quotation marks, in righteousness there is great simplicity. And every case that confronts us in life, there is either a right way or a wrong way to proceed. If we choose the right way, hear that? If we choose the right way, we are sustained in our actions by the principles of righteousness, in which there is power from the heavens. If we choose the wrong way and act on that choice, there is no such heavenly promise or power, and we are alone and destined destined to fail. In Mormonism... Just like in Catholicism, one must be found to be righteous in order to be justified. That justification is applied directly to welfare on this earth, so it also becomes a sort of a prosperity gospel of spiritual welfare, which is, is prominent in some Protestant traditions as, as well. Jehovah Witnesses define righteousness like this. The Hebrew, Sadek, and Sadaka, as well as the Greek, Dikaisene, have the thought of, here it is again, rectitude, uprightness, indicating a standard or norm determined, uh, determining what is upright. Righteousness in the biblical sense is a condition of rightness, the standard of which God, which is 
estimated according to the divine standard, which shows itself in behavior conformable to God. So righteousness, again, is found in human behavior, human work, human, human merit, so that people might be measured on the scales of justice. and has to do above all things with its relation to God and with the walk before Him. So if you fail to walk in God, God doesn't love you. That's what the Jehovah's Witness would say, according to that statement. In Islam, one's righteousness is one's belief in right things, which actually gets us closer to the biblical definition, but still not there. Instead of being like this outward work, it's just an inward work of the person still. Here is what the Quran says. Righteousness is not turning your faces towards the east or the west. Righteous are those who believe in God, the last day, the angels, the scripture, and the prophets. And they give the money cheerfully to the relatives, the orphans, the needy, the traveling alien, the beggars, and to free the slaves. And they observe the contact prayers, salat, and give the obligatory charity, zakat. And they keep their word whenever they make a promise. And they steadfastly persevere in the face of persecution, hardship, and war. These are are the truthful. These are the righteous. And as we place this in the context of the, the Muslim definition of, of faith, it is self-righteousness that brings faith and by which one submits to their God. And their God's choosing is based upon his knowledge of who will submit to him or, or not. I could go on but we're out of, out of time. <laughs> this, is, this is sufficient to give us an idea of what the world thinks regarding righteousness. In virtually every tradition, righteousness is something we earn. We either must be found to be righteous on God's scales of justice, or we must be made righteous so that God will find us righteous on the scales of justice, or, or we must be declared righteous by Christ and imputed with His righteousness so that we are not judged by our unrighteousness, which is our trying to uh, work our way or merit our way or do things to appear to be righteous. That is unrighteousness. Self-righteousness is unrighteousness according to the book of Romans. We must be declared to be righteous, imputed, infused, infused with the very righteousness of Christ. I must receive God's righteousness to be justified. I must receive God's righteousness to be justified. I must receive God's righteousness to be justified. Finally, righteousness in action. Righteousness is a separate work from sanctification. Both of these works are under the umbrella of God's saving work, right? But for me to be declared righteous, I receive the righteousness of Christ in my person wholly and completely so that I am in one moment justified before the God of the universe, by the God of the universe, by grace and through the faith that he has given me. This is what righteousness is. It's received all at one time. It depends not on my works, not on my merits, not on my good deeds, not on any of that. So all of a sudden, since Christ's righteousness is imputed to me, I have the freedom to love people unconditionally, even people who don't believe the way that I believe, even people who aren't a part of the same theological camp that I am a part of, even people who don't read the scriptures the same as I do, even people who don't come to my church, even people who aren't a part of my denomination, even people who don't classify themselves as, as Christian because I believe that the scriptures teach that Christ's righteousness is imputed and I don't have to earn righteousness on my own. I can believe that any person of any ethnicity in any land, every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every color of skin, every age, male and female both, can be justified before the God of the universe, all because I believe that righteousness is imputed and not 
earned or that I don't have to be found to be righteous, that I'm not made righteous in and of myself. All of a sudden, I can believe because Christ's righteousness is imputed. All of a sudden, I can believe that infants who aren't able to understand the gospel can be with Jesus, can be justified before Christ because Christ is the one that does the justifying. All of a sudden, I can believe that the tribal person living on an island that hasn't been discovered and hasn't had a chance to hear from the missionary can be justified before God because Christ is the one doing the justifying work. If I believe that I have to be found to be righteous, if I believe that I must be made righteous, then I also must believe that all infants who are who are not baptized and pass away do not get to be with Jesus. I have to believe that unless a missionary goes and preaches the word to someone else and they accept that word, that they don't get to be with Jesus either. But because I believe that righteousness is imputed, that it is transfused by Christ, by grace and through faith, I am justified. I'm not telling you the reality of the way things are, but I am saying this, that I am justified in believing that all infants get to be with Jesus. And I am justified in believing that Christ can save and does save people who have not heard the name of Jesus, but who Christ has decided to justify anyway, because Christ is the one who decides to do that, as we read in Scripture. This is good news. (laughs) This is such good news. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus that his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Here are the three points we'll walk away with this morning. First, God alone is righteous. Second, I must receive God's righteousness in order to be justified. And third, only God can justify. Only God can justify.